Can you feel the power? <laughs> it is great to be here today with you, and I have, I have a thing I want you to do. It's a survey, so if the ushers will please pass out index cards to everybody. And this is especially for folks that are, that are members of the congregation, so if you're a guest this morning, don't feel obligated, although you may do this if you would like to. We are aware that there are, well, probably the vast majority of the people in the congregation are involved in some way with supporting, helping, uh, caring for, doing something for at least one person who is 55 or above and not able to do all of what they used to be able to do for themselves, okay? Um, so what we would like for you to do is first print your name, and, and please do print, print your name on the index card, and then if you would, over the course of the service, do a quick list of the, the various things that you might be involved with. Maybe it's mowing a neighbor's yard. Maybe it's picking up a newspaper for somebody down the street. Maybe it's giving somebody a ride to the store occasionally. Maybe it's somebody within your home or family that you are the primary caretaker for. Um, maybe it's, it's writing cards or making phone calls or whatever, whatever it is. If you go visit uh, friends or, or other folks at the nursing homes, that, that kind of thing. Um, if, this, if you have a job that involves taking care of folks, if you, would, if you would just list that briefly. Now, you don't have to write an essay. This is just a quick list, all right? But, uh, but we're wanting to get kind of an idea of the involvement of our folks, because we know it's there. We just want to we want to get it in, uh, in gray and white and, and kind of keep track of that and see if there are other ways that we need to be involved and active or if you are aware of things that, uh, that others might do that could be helpful in the way that you are being helpful. So if you would, as, as we prepare for worship this morning, if you would just jot down those things, and then when the, when the offering plate is passed, if, you, if you're finished with it at that point, you can put it in the offering plate, or you can turn it in at the end of the service, okay? We come together to worship God, and one of the ways we worship is by serving. So the, the questionnaire is, is kind of a way of you telling us uh, one of the ways that you worship and, and work for God as the week goes on, even, even though maybe you're not doing it as, a, as an extension of the church or, or that sort of thing, it is, it is indeed an, um, an extension of the love of Christ. So if you, would, if you would write those things down, and then if God is working in your heart this morning and saying, You've dedicated your life to Christ, but it's, it's time for you to rededicate your life. Um, we, we in the United Methodist Church believe that we're always in the process of rededication because we mess up and we come back. And so we are always invited to return in a renewed way to God. Um, if, that's, if that's where you're being led, or if God is calling you into a new relationship of some sort with God and with the divine, if God is saying, this is the time for you to become a part of this congregation, or this is the time for you to become part of the body of Christ, maybe you haven't done that before. Maybe, maybe you love Jesus, but you haven't officially joined with uh, part of the body of Christ, then I invite you to be listening for how God speaks to you about that today and be responsive to it. Let us begin our worship.
The hymn is, Oh, Worship the King. Let it stand as we sing as you are able this morning. Please remain standing as we repeat together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and if the children will come. Good morning. Good morning. Doesn't work. <laughs> loud. I won't say it loud. You say it loud. Ready? Go. Good morning. Oh, I'll go for it. But you can get louder than that. Okay, kids. All right, Don. <laughs> I'm holding it right here where I'm supposed to. All right. I have a word for you. The word is stewardship. Yeah. Okay. Stewardship. Does anybody know what stewardship means? No idea. That's a big word. It's a hard word. <laughs> Kayla says, look it up in the dictionary. You're right. Okay. All right. What it means, it means 
Hannah knew because we practiced this, but it means something important. The management of something important. What's important in your life? Tell me. What's important? Challenging others. Say that again. Helping others. Helping others is important? That's wonderful. I think your family. Your family is important. Yes, Preston. Being kind. Oh, that's very important. Reese? Share. Is what? Share. Sharing? Good job. Kind. Being kind? Okay. Kind. Kind. You want to tell me again? Kind. Kind. Thank you. (laughs) Kayla? Water. Water is important. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's three, well, two things is what, but really I call three, that are very important to us. It's water, food, and clothes. Oh, I like that one. Tell tell me again, what is it? And God. And God, yes. Well, you know, we said the management of things that are important, we named some things that were important. Is God important to you? Yeah. Okay. What about money? (laughs) Whoa. Where are the parents of these children? (laughs) Okay. Money may not be important to you, but do you think it's important to your parents? Yes. It's very important to your parents. (laughs) We're starting to fight over here. (laughs) Okay. So, do we need... Just to give God money? No. No. What do we need to also give God? You don't know? Well, you said, no, it's not the only thing. What? Love. We're giving you love, yeah. What about time? Yeah, your time. You never thought about that? Well, in children's church, we're going to learn about giving our time to God. Okay? All right, let's say a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for your love. Help us to learn more about time and giving you our time and money and our love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Exit, stage right. Okay. <laughs> Too much fun. Um, as, we, as we worship this morning, I'm going to be talking to you in the sermon about some, some vision that we have and some plans that are coming up. But in our, in our immediate future, there is an opportunity which I would offer you. And that is for uh, fifth quarter on the evening of October the 20th. Okay, we and Zion UCC are co-hosting fifth quarter again this year. We're going to have it out here in the in the parking lot and street in front of the church, and we have some neat plans. And we already have hot dogs. Uh, We're going to need some people to. What? Oh, oh, Nancy's saying thank you, thank you, thank you, because we have lots of hot dogs. So we have we have hot dogs, we have chips, we we're gonna have water, we have snow cones, we have uh, popcorn, and Zion is working this morning on what they're gonna be bringing. So there'll be more food than the kids can stand to eat. Now, what I need is some help. All right, and we need we need for people who will engage with 
the, the kids who are mostly middle schoolers. The high school kids don't tend to come to fifth quarter, but the middle schoolers do. And, uh, and for a, a contingent of our folks with happy smiling faces and warm presence <coughs> to be here for that time period. Now, I've, I've waited until now to tell you what time we're talking about, but you know that fifth quarter goes, you need to be here about 10 p.m. and, uh, and, and stay till midnight when everything shuts down. Um, so those, those of you who are able to do that, I am, I am trusting the Lord for about 10 of us who have, who have that late night capability and energy and will be, here, will be here to serve in various capacities during that time. And Zion's gonna have about the same number of people here, so we'll, we'll be well covered with people to play with the kids and relate to the kids and serve the kids and, and do all of those kinds of things. So uh, let me just have a show of hands right now, those, uh, every, every head bowed and every eye. Oh no, uh, you, you keep your eyes open and look around and see. But who, who thinks they can be here and be a part of that evening. Is it the 13th or is it the 20th? I keep getting myself confused. Okay, well, if it's the 13th, then that's coming this Friday. Okay, so even sooner. How do? Yeah, the 13th is homecoming, so that is the date, right? Because when I first wrote it down in my calendar, somebody said the 20th, and I wrote that down. Okay, thank you. I stand corrected. So the 13th, this Friday, see less time to worry about it. So who thinks they can probably be here to help out that evening? Okay, and who can come and help me at some point on Thursday? And then again, maybe on Friday, not the same people necessarily, but to get things set up, to string lights and that sort of thing. This is not the late night thing. This is a whole separate deal. Can you come and help set up? Okay, cool, cool. Um, let's say any time between, I don't have my calendar on me, any time between, I have Lions Club, okay, um, like 10, no, because I have Bible study. All right, let's do the afternoon, all right? Let's do the afternoon and say from one until three, either of those days. One until three, either of those days. Okay, that work? All right, all right. So, just, just saying, be ready. You'll be getting emails, you'll be seeing it on Facebook. So be ready, because this is one of the ways we reach out with God's love to the, the youth of our community and to the families of our community. So we want to, we want to be sure that we are, are here present and providing a good, solid Christian presence for them that evening. Will the ushers please come? Lord God, we pray your blessing on all that we have, all that we are, all that we give back to you. We ask that it would receive a special measure of your blessing so that it might build up your kingdom and turn us in all of our ways to turn to you and to offer all that we can, all that we are and every moment of our days to your service. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
remain standing as you are able as we sing What a Mighty God We Serve. As we come to prayer time this morning, I call your attention to our prayer request printed in the bulletin. And um, uh, Johnny Kleine continues to hold her own and, and hang on, so continue in prayer for her and for the family. Um, Judy Sisson had her knee surgery this week and is home from that. Um, if you would please add family of to the name of David Maurer. That is uh, Kat Johnson's brother who passed away overnight Friday. So if you would be in prayer for Kat and Pat and the rest of the family as they gather to celebrate his life and, uh, and mourn his passing. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy God, we come before you today 
in the coolness of an autumn day, in the sunshine brilliance of your grace and your mercy. We come before you as broken people trusting in you and thanking you for all with which you have blessed us, even to this day. We thank you, Lord, for the marvel of your universe and our life in it, the intricacies and the, and the glories of all that is around us. We come together before you, Lord, confessing our sin, our distance from you, our brokenness, our smallness, our pettiness, our hatefulness, the limited insight that, that we choose to have, the limited vision, the limited life. And as we come before you, we confess that we are angry and we are disturbed by those things and those people, those incidents, those happenings that tear at the fabric of our lives and unsettle us. We seek your forgiveness for our lack of faith and trust in you. We seek your forgiveness for those times when our hearts are turned to anger, our actions to rudeness or ungraciousness, lack of justice and or lack of mercy. Lord God, for the distance that is between who we are and who you have created us to be, for the distance between our actions and your goodness, we thank you that you are there to make up the difference. We thank you for your forgiving nature. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, our savior. And we ask, Lord, that we would be able to accept and acknowledge that gift and that we would be able to live into it through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, not to despair. Help us, Lord, not to give up or become bitter and skeptical, but to always be open to the goodness which you continually pour out on us and around us. Lord God, we pray this morning for all who are broken and all who are sad, for all whose lives are torn apart by the hatred of others, the evil actions of other people. We pray for those gathered in Las Vegas and we pray, Lord, for all of those everywhere who suffer in similar fashion. We ask for your presence. We ask for your comfort. We seek for them and for ourselves your peace. As we come together, Lord, we give you thanks for all of the mercy and the gentleness and the goodness which floods all around us. Help us to see that, Lord, in the face of one bad actor. Help us to see the faces of thousands who act according to your will, even though they may not be aware of what motivates them. Lord God, here and everywhere around the world, We seek your face. We ask for your provision and your protection. We ask for your strength and your courage for those who in any way are in danger and especially for those who choose to put themselves in the path between evil and righteousness between evil and innocence, between evil and goodness. Lord God, 
give them an extra measure of your love. And we pray today that you would transform the mind, that you would remold the heart, that you would stay the hand and change the life of anyone who is seeking to harm others by thought, by word, by deed. Lord God, only your transformation is enough. We pray that and we pray that our wills will be subject to yours and not resistant to your goodness. We come together asking in prayer what your Son, our Savior, taught us to ask and trusting in your great gift to us through him as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
my Savior and my God. And that's what it's all about, right? I wonder if, uh, if I were to sit down and have a conversation with you individually, what you would tell me about your faith life, your faith story. What would you tell me about um, where you first encountered church, where you first encountered God, how you first heard about Jesus? There's some of us that would go back to pre-birth to, to tell that story. There are others who didn't hear the good news until later in life and came to realize it. Um, there, is, there is power in whatever your story might be. For a long time when I was, when I was growing up, I would hear the dramatic stories of conversion that some folks would tell, you know, how, how horrible they had been and how terrible their life was and how ripped up everything was and, you know, very obvious bad things that they would talk about and, and how they had then come to know Jesus in, in some way, sometimes through something dramatic, sometimes through something very, very soft and quiet. But, uh, but when they came to know Jesus, then their, their life became transformed. And sudden, sometimes that was a very sudden change and a, and a quick turnaround. And those are, those are the, um, the stories of powerful testimony, right? And some of you may have those stories. Some of you have heard those stories. And some of you may have been discouraged by those stories because that wasn't your story. And it occurred to me at, uh, at some point in my adult life, I think when I was probably in my 40s, um, it occurred to me that I was glad, I was thankful that I didn't have one of those dramatic stories. I had always been kind of sorry that I didn't, but then I became glad that I didn't because the pain that I was spared by not having one of those dramatic conversions. All of the pain of life without God for all of those years before. And I was, I was humbled by that and humbled by the great gift that I had of not having been through that kind of misery. Now I've set up my own kind of misery and I think all of us, all of us do in one way or the other. And so all of us, all of us have deep sin from which we need to turn and from which we need to move into the, the powerful grace of God and allow God's forgiveness. Uh, some, of, some of our stories don't make for dramatic telling, but oh, they make for powerful testimony in talking with someone else who is on the same road or a similar road, we can find ourselves in scripture, especially in the, in the, par the parable of the, uh, the elder brother and the, and the prodigal or, or wasteful father and the son who went into bad circumstances and returned. We, we usually call it the story of the prodigal son, but all of us can maybe see ourselves reflected in that and so many of the other stories that Jesus told and stories that are in scripture. And we can see how our life has been molded and changed and turned around by the power of the Holy Spirit through our knowledge of, our faith in God, God's intervention, in our lives? How has God intervened in your life? Where has God spoken a word to you? Where has God given you a word of hope or a word of forgiveness or a word of correction or a word of justice and said, you need to change this. You need to come home to me or you need to stay here with me and keep enjoying that relationship that you have always had with me, that relationship of love and power so that you can be the, the steady beacon 
for those who are going astray. What is your story and how have you told it? How have you shared it? Who else knows your story? Do your own children know your story? Do your nieces and nephews, your grandchildren, your brothers, your sisters, do they know your story? Do they know the story of God's relationship with you? In the, in the Thursday morning Bible study that we've just started, we're, we're starting with God's relationship with humanity in the beginning and talking about that, that whole beauty of that which is relational, that which is of God, that which draws us all together as, as God's creatures, as God's very good and blessed creation. And I have a, I have a concern it's been a concern of mine since I was a child. It's, it's the, the basis, I guess, of my calling to ministry. And that is the concern that people don't know God. Now, I don't, I don't think that it's up to me to be the one telling everybody about God. Different people are called to different parts of the message and different parts of the story and different parts of conveying the importance of God to different people. Because there, there are some people that won't listen to a word I ever say. There are others who will respond. There are people who will listen to you that wouldn't listen to somebody else. There are people who will look at you and you will never know the impact you have or have had in their lives. You won't know what a difference you have made. Let us pray that that difference is always a difference for good, that that difference is always a, a difference for God, that that difference is always a difference that will bring joy into the life of whoever that person might be. And so I refer you to the book of Proverbs, wisdom from the Old Testament, a line that all of us know. In the 22nd chapter, the wise one says, train children in the way they should go. When they grow old, they won't depart from it. Train children in the way they should go. When they grow old, they won't depart from it. God's words for God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, help us to see you. Help us to hear you. Help us to reflect you. Help us, Lord, to speak truly and to live truly your word. Lord, help me to speak what you would have these, your children, here this morning where I fail to speak what someone needs. Move me over and scatter what I say so that your truth might be planted deeply within their hearts. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All of this to say, folks, we have a job. It's so obvious, not only in our church, don't, don't feel like the Lone Ranger in this, in all churches, regardless of size, regardless of denomination, regardless of music, regardless of whatever. All churches across the western part of our world are rapidly aging and that's okay, because every day we get older and that's a good thing. But the danger is that so many 
in our generations and younger generations see the church as irrelevant, what difference does it make anyway? If I want to do social service, there are plenty of places and ways I can do social service. If I want to serve over here, there are plenty of ways I can serve over here. If I want to give, there are plenty of, there are plenty of ways to give. If I want to make a difference in the world, there are plenty of ways I can make a difference in the world. At least enough to satisfy myself, at least enough to, to, for it to look good on the surface, and for it to make a positive statistical difference. But oh, people, oh, people. The difference is the difference of God's love through Jesus Christ. That is the difference. All of the motivating factors there might be about care for other people and, you know, heart touched by this or touched by that, that's God moving within us whether we acknowledge it or not. But if we don't acknowledge it, if we don't know it, if nobody knows it, if nobody recognizes it, if it is just left for the stones to shout out the glory of God, then how are we depriving others of that love, that joy, that peace that only God can give? I have young friends who, when they were little children, growing up in, in churches other than, other than United Methodist, would, uh, would be in tears about some little friend of theirs who didn't know Jesus and therefore was going to hell. And this little child didn't want to uh, go to heaven unless his little friend so-and-so could go as well. In a strange sort of way, God, God can use any and everything. But that kind of attitude breaks my heart. For someone to want their friend to know, to know Jesus so that they can be together with them in heaven. There's just something to me that's off about that. It's not complete. Because it's still about me and what I want. How do I surrender myself so fully to God through Jesus Christ that I would be able to pray honestly as Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours? What my little friend was experiencing was hopefully just the beginning of a faith journey and not the end. And that in growth and maturity, he has expanded that desire. As a church, what is our desire for those around us? I knew a, I knew a strong churchman once who had the attitude that um, as long as the church was there long enough for him and all of his to have their funeral services, then he didn't much care what happened after. He had the same attitude about the cemetery association. I've known folks who thought, 
oh, well, it's not going to be my problem anymore. I'm going to be out of here. And I think about people who have looked at the world around them and looked at the faith within them and have said, I have a concern for all of those who follow me. So I have a vision for this church. It's not limited only to this church, but this church is a beautiful place for this vision to take root and to happen. Here in the midst of a strong and loving congregation, filled with resources, spiritual and material, Here is a people who can reach out to change the hearts and minds. No. To plow the ground so that God may change the hearts and minds. Of those around us, of our own generation and of younger generations, I went to a conference week before last in which one of the young pastors who was there was talking about in, in her church, she has, she has changed the terminology that maybe some of you have read if you ever read uh, church stuff, you know, statistics about how the church is doing those kinds of things. And you've maybe heard about the, the uh, fastest growing religious preference group in the United States being the nuns. And I'm not talking about Sister Mary Alice. I'm talking, the people, I'm talking about the people who put nun as their religious preference. And then there are the duns the people who have been thoroughly immersed in church and then become thoroughly burned out or disappointed or disillusioned, worn out, and have, and have just said, that's it for me. There are the people who are SBNRs, SBNRs, spiritual but not religious. You've heard people talk about that. I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. I don't believe in organized religion. I don't believe in the church. And this young woman said that instead of any of those names for those groups, and those are just identifying names, but, but they can become pejoratives. Instead of calling them any of those things, they re she refers to them as spiritual nomads. People who are motivated by God but looking, looking. And there isn't one answer. All of the articles I read, you know, it's here's the answer for this and that. no. <laughs> Just change the music and they'll come. Change the architecture, put coffee in the front foyer, da 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 da. Think about what matters to you. Why are you here? If you have children and grandchildren, where are they this morning? Where are they on most Sunday mornings? And what's the reason they are where they are, wherever that may be, on Sunday mornings? What I am proposing for us is that we employ a full-time person who is called to student ministry. Not somebody who's doing it part-time while they're doing something else, 
not whoever the youngest person in our church happens to be at the moment, but somebody who is intentional about loving young people into faith in Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean we hire that person and say, okay, you go to it. The rest of us are just going to be over here doing what we do. No, no, we're, we're in full partnership with that person. We're in full accord working with and helping. Now, I've been, I've been doing the youth ministry for the couple of years I've been here and have, have been doing that so that I can observe, so that I can watch, so that I can see, so that I, so that I can know. And I know that this church is filled with marvelous people and I want young people to be in relationship with you. To learn how faith is lived, how faith is laughed, how faith is loved. I want them to know you well enough that they don't buy into the stereotypes that are out there in the media and in the press and just in the world in general, just the, just the kind of thrown off statements about the church being full of hypocrites. How old is that? I mean, when we were kids, they were saying that. Yeah, the church is full of hypocrites. And so is every place else. And we, by golly, acknowledge that we're hypocrites sometimes and we're mighty sorry for it and we're trying to get better. And we are sinners and we are sorry for it and we're trying to learn better and we're trying to do better. And being Christian does not make us any better than anybody else. It so disappoints me when I, when I see Christians expecting, well, we're a nonprofit or we're a church, so we don't have to pay the tax. And having an attitude about it, you know? What was that I preached a few weeks ago about walking humbly with God? Mm. Or you need to trust me because I'm a Christian? A lot of people suffered a lot of hurt because of that one. What is it? about you as an individual Christian human being? What is it about this church as an individual part of the body of Christ? What is it about all of the churches with whom we associate and relate? What is it that marks the people of Christ? What is it that scripture says they will know you are Christians by your love? They will know you are Christians by your love. So what I'm proposing is that we hire this person. And that this person's job be primarily, especially during the first year, not to create instant youth group, because folks, that isn't going to happen. But that this person be put in a position of going into all of the schools, because we would call this a, a director of student and family ministry, to be in ministry with all of the people who are like kindergarten through high school into college, and building relationships with the schools, the school personnel, the school students, the parents, not to get all of them to come to our church, but just so that we'll have a bridge of relationship so that if somebody needs something, we're aware of it and we can act and respond. If somebody would thrive in, in one of the other wonderful churches in this community, then help direct them to that. For this person to work together with the other youth ministers in this community to do good things for the students. There are so many times that it isn't a matter of a group getting together and doing something. It's a matter of one young person having some kind of issue or some kind of need or some kind of problem and knowing that there's somebody over here they can talk to. Maybe that's the pastor. Maybe that's this, this student ministry director. Maybe it's somebody that the student ministry director has introduced them to in the congregation. Maybe it's one of you. 
but for a year just to work on building relationships and see where that goes. Because what, what I've been doing the last couple of years, for a little while we had some regular meetings and meeting times, and that worked for a, a short season with a, a small group of kids. But then it ceased to work with, with the individuals that are a, a, a natural part of our church congregation because of their schedules, because of their family life, because of, you know, just all kinds of different reasons. The, the main reason people aren't in church at a, at a given time is not because of the church. It's because of our own lives and what we have going on. But we decided as, as a group of, of parents and youth that we would do special events so we go to midwinter retreat. We go to mission trip in the summer. We send kids to summer camp. We do those things that are the event ministries that are one of the main ways people come to Christ, quite frankly. We're doing those things. So I would expect that person to keep doing those things and for me to walk along with them as we, as we initiate those and as we build those relationships. And then to gradually grow into whatever the community needs and for however long it needs it. And if the season for that ends, to move into something else. But that person would help be a vanguard for us to be out in the community where the people are. I think it's important that we have a beautiful place to be and a home base, a mission station from which to work and operate. I think it's important for us to have strong, passionate worship on Sundays. I think it's important for us to have a, a place and a people with whom to gather to do service and mission and care for each other and care for other people. All of that is critical and vital and important, and I'm not willing to let go of any of that. But we also need to be out in the community moving and doing. It's one of the reasons I asked for the response on the survey cards because there are people in this community who desperately need your testimony, your witness about the love of Jesus Christ, because it's about relationship, because it's about love. And that is what I am wanting us to help facilitate. So I'm proposing a, a combination of a, of a compensation package that would include housing and utilities, fixing up the Ann's house so that we would be offering a person a place to live. I, I really don't believe in there being a separate like youth hut or something like that. I've, I've, uh, I have all kinds of reasons for it, and I can explain to you at some point. But I, I don't want to use the Ann's house for that. I want to use it for a place for a person to live so that they will be here like the pastor is next door and integral to the community and what's happening, not driving in from someplace else. And that the total compensation be something that would be the equivalent of a first-year teacher in the school district here so that the person can actually live and not have to not have to give a get a second job to build those relationships to introduce us to help connect us and to keep us in close communion with the younger parts of our community and to let the younger parts of our community know that we are warm and caring and loving, open, broken, authentic parts of the body of Christ. 
I'm asking that you pray heavily about that. Because the difference in every life is a relationship, not a law, not a degree, not an experience, but a relationship. And the main relationship is the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Holy Lord, draw us, lead us, empower us, help us to partner with you in what you would have us do. In Jesus' holy name, amen. A reminder that we have lunch. After service, if you had forgotten, that's okay. Come anyway and fellowship with everyone. If you want to talk with me or anybody else about any of what I was preaching about this morning, I invite you to come and let's have conversation. But be conscious and intentional, even now, about how you reach and how you touch others. If you have a response to make to God, come as we sing our closing hymn. Will you stand as you are able? Lord God, we thank you for the food we are about to receive, for all who have produced and transported and processed and prepared it, for those who have brought it today, and the love with which we will share with one another. Bless us, Lord, so that we might bless others. And go out now into God's world, knowing and trusting that God is your power, God is your strength, God is your mercy. In Jesus' holy name, amen.